Boy, here we are again, folks. <clears throat> Brother Peter, so proud to be with you today. Another day that God has blessed us with some good health. I'm 74 years old, and God blessed me with some good health. And I keep praying, God, Lord, please keep me well until <clears throat> you're done using me on this earth in some good health. And I have my, a picture of my mother here, who, bless her heart, she's in heaven now. And I believe uh, her beautiful face is looking down and uh, seeing her son uh, following Jesus. Amen. And this is important. I tell you what, I hope and pray that all of my children uh, will uh, respect the fact that when I die and go to heaven, that I'm going to be around. <laughs> I'm not going to leave them. I'm gonna, I'd hate to have to frown on them for things they were doing. I would like to know they were following the Lord. So anyway, here we are today. We're going to talk. Paul uh, wrote 13 letters. They're called epistles. And he wrote those to different people. Now Paul the apostle, remember he was the guy Saul that was killing the Christians, persecuting the church. His last, one of his last acts, and it, it infuriated God evidently so much he said, I'm going I'm, I'm to have you do some things that you don't think you're going to, you could do. And um, Stephen was stoned to death. And Stephen said, Lord, lay this not to their charge. And, and because he said that, I believe that God said, well, I'm not going to do it, Stephen, just because you've asked me not to, I'm not going to lay it to his charge. But what I am going to do is I'm going to change him. So he met uh, uh, Paul on the road to Damascus, and he knocked him off his donkey and blinded him, and uh, said, uh, 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 and, and I love the fact that Paul said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> he had never had any Lord in his life. The Lord he had in his life was the law. He followed the law of God. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. By rights, he was a, in, in, according to the law, he was a man that walked circumspectly to the law and about as perfect as you could get. So therefore he considered himself a very righteous person. The Bible calls it sometimes self-righteousness what Paul walked in when it walked in as far as the Roman law was concerned. See, what Paul was doing was according not only to the law of God, but what the Roman law was doing. And so uh, they were kind of afraid in that day that King Jesus was going to be outrule the king in the land. And so they were still worried about that. So uh, Paul comes along by the way, he holds two citizenships. He holds a rightful citizenship in Rome, and he holds a rightful citizenship that he's a Jew. And it's a very odd situation that he is a Jew and a Roman citizen at the same time. But he was such a smart, he was a very, very smart man. But I'm going to tell you what first thing he did. When he got saved, first thing he did was set himself apart for three years of study and put himself into study and learning what he was going to do. I think it's very important, very important that we do not enter into God's work as a novice without study. And Paul was the example for that. The express nature, just the nature of his Gospels tell us we must be learned. And we must know the relations in the Old Testament and the Jewish law is different. The Ten Commandments. We see we drive by house after house after house today. It says we live by the Ten Commandments. Those folks with that sign in their yard have no idea what the Ten Commandments were written for. They were written for a picture to show us we could not live by them. The only person in the whole world, period, bar none, all the billions of people that have been born and gone, there was only one that kept the law. 
And his name was Jesus. The only person that ever didn't break the law was Jesus. Well, you say he did some things that looked like he broke the law. It might look like it, but it wasn't. It, he didn't break it. He was the only righteous uh, a person that ever walked on the earth. He was born righteous, and he died righteous for you and I, taking the sin of the world on us. What was the major doctrine in the book of Romans when Paul wrote the book of Romans? The major doctrine was salvation, which he had got uh, by, by Jesus personally. Do you know that he could not be an apostle unless Jesus visited him personally? The only person who could be an apostle was the person who saw Jesus personally talk with him. And Paul did. He talked with him. This is why when uh, Judas left the twelve and the father said, you know, I believe there's supposed to be twelve of us. They just had an inbred feeling that needed to be twelve and they brought this guy Mathis on board. That was not planned by God. That was a human thing they did. God's plan was to visit Paul. His name was Saul at that time. And he was a persecutor of the Christians. Let's open our Bible to uh, chapter 3 in the book of Romans. By the way, we use a Bible called the King James Bible. I have in front of me right now, today, the King James Bible. And I have a <clears throat> commentary put out by Jerry Fowle several years ago in Liberty, uh, Baptist Liberty uh, College. And uh, what we have here in Romans is we need to see Paul bringing the message that he got, that he had to be saved. He had to have salvation. He was a man righteous by the law, in a big sense of the word, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Yet he had to put down that Pharisaical life and take up the salvation life. And he, he was the heathen of heathens. <laughs> so was I. And God took me in. Uh, his salutation in Romans uh, 1, 1 through 7, let's take a look at that. Romans 1, 1 through 7, when it comes on board, and he's writing this letter to the Roman church now. The instructions, Paul, he says, got his name up there. Who's it from? It's from Paul. Got his name up there. Who is he? He's a servant of Jesus Christ. He says so right here. Uh, what is he called to do? He's called to be an apostle. The only way he could be called to be an apostle was to have had a conversation with Jesus Christ personally. Jesus came from heaven, met him on the road, turned him around, changed his life, separated under the gospel of God, and separated him under the gospel of God. He had to go some, somewhere and get baptized. You say, but he got baptized by the Holy Spirit when he got in. Yes. But there was another command from Jesus that we needed to have water baptism. And so, here's a guy persecuting killing the Christians. Now, he's going to have to do this thing that looks kind of foolish for him to go down and let a man dip him in the water and pull him back up. And he's going to now identify himself with Jesus Christ. This is his breaking separation point. When you go get baptized after you're saved, that's your separation point. Saying you are set apart now. You are no more going to be of the world. You're going to be in the world, but not of the world. As you were before. Verse 2 he said, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. Nobody, but nobody, but nobody knew the Scriptures any better than Paul did. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. 
By the time he was 13 years old, he had to go through what was called a bar mitzvah. He had to quote nearly the whole Old Testament. I mean, he had to stand up for three solid hours and quote scripture out of his mind. Then he knew. He knew the scripture. <clears throat> now he said, in verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, Paul writing this first book here, he has brought up some very, very important things out of the Old Testament. That David was the first guy up there, uh, had a throne, and that throne was going to be uh, reckoned as the throne, as Jesus said, his throne was going to be from that same lineage. What is that? That's the seed. The seed of the woman back in uh, Genesis 3.15. That seed was brought down through the throne of David. Now, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, promised by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. All the way through the Old Testament points directly to Jesus. The whole Old Testament points to Jesus. And here he comes. Now I'm in the King James Version, by the way. We're going to use that. Verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Wow. <laughs> First man to raise from the dead and still alive. Stay alive. First man raised and stay alive. You say, has there been others in the Old Testament that were raised from the dead? Yes, there were. But they died again. Jesus didn't die again. They put him on the cross but then he went to heaven. He came out of the grave. The grave couldn't hold him. Fire couldn't hold him. He walked through hell. Walked through hell. Came out of hell without the smell of smoke on him. Preached to those in hell. We see this servant, Paul. Very consistent. I shouldn't use the word almost very because very means it could be a variation. But he was consistent. He was, he was the epitome of consistency. That means there was no inconsistency in him whatsoever. He was it. The most consistent human being that ever walked on two feet. He begins each of his epistles with his own name. He doesn't mind using his name. His name was a good name. His name had no faults in it. Had no, no nothing in it because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He couldn't be accused by those of the law of breaking the law. Yet I'm sure that he did because nobody could keep the law. But, but that's the kind of guy he was. He gives a salutation and adds a note of thanks given to all of those that read his epistles. For all the readers of his epistles, he'll give a salutation to it uh, when you get to it. And that salutation, let's keep this in our mind, what he had in his mind. What did he have in his mind? He had in his mind that... Uh, he was a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. He was a servant of Jesus Christ. He says so in his epistles. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And I was called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in order to be an apostle, like I said, you'd have had to talk to him, and he did. I like the fact of what he says down here, and he says it several times in his Gospels. Separated. Separated. Under the Gospel of God. 
how does that happen? When you ask Jesus to come in your heart, forgive you of your sin, and you separate yourself from the world, you are brought in to where you are under the gospel of God. What is that, Brother Peter? Well, I lived for the devil for 30 years. Part of those 30 years of living for the devil, <clears throat> it was daily drinking alcohol. Blowing smoke in God's face with a smoke stick. Uh, cussing and, and got carrying on. Raveling. Doing wicked things, things that should have been <clears throat> put in prison for. And God saw fit to call me out of that and put me in the gospel, separate me to the gospel of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Which He had, he had promised that before uh, by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. He had promised if we say, God, I am a sinner, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save my soul that I could be what Paul the Apostle was. Except I can't be an apostle, but I can do what Paul did. I can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ concerning his son. Concerning, I can claim the gospel of God and the scriptures uh, through his son concerning Jesus Christ, our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Why, why, are we, why is that so important, Brother Peter? Because Jesus was God in the flesh. Yet he had to come in the flesh after the seed of David. After the seed of David, he had to be in the flesh. Wow. There's too much to develop right there today. Who declared to be the Son of God with power. Wow. He didn't just say, I am the Son of God and didn't have any power. No. Everything he touched, walked by, whatever he said, there was no, no, nada, no failure in his life. No untruth and no failure. Everything he said or did was, came to pass, was appointed. According to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Wow. Paul writing to the Romans, he wrote to them about the salvation. Uh, in Romans 3, 1, 21 through 26, are the key passages uh, of Romans. And let's look at verse 21 by chance here. Ah. Uh, in chapter 3 and verse 21. Let me get over here where we were looking at it here. Uh, the sovereignty of God. 3 and 21. Get your Bible out. If you haven't uh, paused, pause for a minute and go get your Bible. Get it down there beside you and so you can follow on. Uh, 3 and 21 says this. Uh, let's come here, this 3 and 21. Let me, let me get to the right place here. The righteousness of God. Hey, there's only one righteousness in this world. There was only one righteous person, which was Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of God, uh, without the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. By the law and the prophets, we see the witness of righteousness. The, the Ten Commandments are totally righteous. No man's ever been able to live by them except Jesus Christ. <laughs> Woo -wee. We break the first one. Have no other gods before me. We break that first one every day. If we get up, Put our feet on the floor in the morning. 
and haven't said the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, recognizing God is Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, hallowing his name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wow. Asking him for it. Give us this day. And that's what he says in that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, you just took yourself out of the equation. Now you're in the equation, and God has heard that prayer, and he's looking down, and he's saying, that one of my servants right there, uh, I'm going to bless him today, and we're going from this moment on, and we're going to have a good day. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, put him, the righteousness of God first, undivided. You cannot divide the righteousness of God and the self of man. I'm the most self-worth, worth, self, <laughs> worthless self-person on the earth, but that's not what I was going to say. I'm the most self-pleasing uh, uh, person on earth. I want to please myself. I want to please me all the time. I want to be pleased. Well, I tell you what. When I'm being pleased, God more than likely isn't. So the only way I can be pleased and God be pleased too is be in His Word. Be studying. Be working. Be writing. Be preaching. Be talking. Be witnessing. Every single move that I make today, I pray is going to be in the will of God. You say, what if you're going down the interstate, uh, Pete, and you get broadsided and you're in the ditch and you're there? Well, if I'm alive in any way, shape, or form and have a mouth, I'm going to testify all the way to the ambulance driver, <laughs> to the hospital bed, to the nurse, to the doctor, until I come home. I'm going to be the same witness in that condition that I am before I got in that condition. There's no downtime in spiritual living. None. No downtime. Paul the Apostle, from the day he got saved to the day he died, didn't have a downtime. No downtime. Wow. Justification. You know that God took him on just as if he had never sinned? You know, there's no telling how many Christians that man had killed. Hey, he didn't just kill them. He said, you take this one down, and I want you to make sure that he gets in with the lions. I want the lions to eat him. And, and I want you to take his family and throw them in there. His wife, his kids, the whole nine yards. Get rid of all of them. And you say, and that man got forgiven? Yes, God forgave him. Do you know that he was rightful in what he was doing according to the law? According to him, when these guys started following Jesus, he didn't realize that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. So therefore, he said, these guys are breaking the law. But when Jesus met him face to face on the road to Damascus, changed his life. Now he had to go back and recant. Say, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. And you know what, too? He had to go to Rome and recant among the Romans. When he got saved, and that's why he's back, that's why this book of Romans is written. Because he's recanting what he did before he got saved. Where did he start? He started at his home home base. Where do you and I start? We, we say we drop in somewhere to a church meeting and the Lord works on us and, and, and touches our heart and we get saved. Where are we going to go? We're going to go back home. What are you going to do when you get back home? You're going to say to the people, I am no longer an alcoholic. I no longer cuss and swear every time I open my mouth. I no longer steal and, and rob and cheat. 
I now am a Christian. I'm following the Lord. And I'm going to put all these other things behind me. <laughs> I'm going to take on the righteousness of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And <laughs> I had neighbors that said, Who are you trying to kid? Who are you trying to kid? I won't give you a month. You be right back here. Well, that was in 1972, November 5th, when I got saved. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I hadn't returned back yet. And will not. I'm a new man now. And all and upon all them that believe, he said. Upon all. A-L-L. -L, all. All that believe have Turn the tide just like Paul the Apostle did. And in Romans, he's telling them the difference of being having faith in Jesus Christ and having faith in your own self and in the law. And the difference was the opposite. The letter of the law killeth. But the faith of the law is truth. And it makes a difference. He wanted to come and visit them shortly after verse 21 is 22. But we're not going to get into that today. What, what was the key doctrine in the book of Romans? What is doctrine? Doctrine is the fact of what the thing says. That's the doctrine of it. The key doctrines in there was first God. He was the first doctrine. God is a doctrine. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That is the Trinity of God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the Trinity of God. Humanity. That was Jesus Christ coming in a human body Carry in the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, in him. When did the church start? When Jesus left, sent that Holy Spirit that was in him out to be in all people at the same time. You say, that's an impossibility, Brother Peter. Except for God, it is. But God about God. This world was without form and void. But God came and moved the water out from it. Who made it? God made it. When did he make it? I don't know, billions of years ago maybe. Why did he make it? I don't know. He probably inhabited it at one time. He might have just made it for the, be the place where he cast Satan because this is what he did. He cast Satan to the heart of the earth where hell is. To the heart of this earth was where Satan was cast. This was Satan's abode. He was here before man was here and showed his head after God made this pure man and he showed his head. There was a guy back in this world, not in the Bible days, all the way up into the 1500s, whose name was Martin Luther. And he read the book of Romans. And by reading what Paul wrote in Romans, he saw that the Catholicism that he was in, he was a leading Catholic. Not that all Catholics will go to hell. If they believe in Jesus Christ, believe Jesus came and died for their sins, rose again on the third day, and now lives at the right hand of God, they can go to heaven. And by the way, uh, you Catholic folks, if you're out there listening to Brother Peter by any chance, you can 
talk directly to God without a human priest. The days of priest offices being in the way that they're taught today is actually wrong. He cannot be your intercessor. Jesus Christ is your intercessor. And the Holy Spirit is your intercessor. And there's no time that you're ever separated away from the intercessor. He's always here. And if we will ask Him, He's the one that goes before God and carries your prayers there and whatever. This guy who is called the Pope is a religious thing. Not necessarily a spiritual thing. It is a re religious thing. And uh, he is wrong to tell you that he can pray you in or out of heaven. He can't do it. He does not have the power to do that. If you're going to go to heaven, you're going to have to separate yourself from adhering to the Pope and get a Bible, a King James Version Bible, get in it and adhere to what God says. And through this Roman letter that Paul wrote, you can find out exactly what God said for you to do. If you just get in, I've got your Bible right here. I've got, I've got, I got, I think I got five Catholic Bibles. And that Catholic Bible right there, that red one right there, says exactly what Paul says right here in Romans. That says exactly what I live by right there in that Bible. You've got it. It's in your Bible. The trouble is, is you have a man up there telling you not to study and not to read that Bible and not to learn what it says because if you do, you're going to learn that he's a false preacher. That he's not telling you the truth. You don't find anywhere in Paul's 13 books where he said you got to pray to me. you got to go through me. No, he was a human being just like everybody else is a human being. And there's only one divine human being and that was Jesus Christ. When it, when it talks about in that Bible, and I, it talks about in the 5th century and in the, some of those uh, popes were divine. No, they weren't divine. Peter was not divine. When you go into a church that has a statue of Peter, and you have to put some money in that plate, or that thing, and get by him and come to another saint, you're wrong to do that. You're worshiping a man, Peter, instead of Jesus Christ. He's the one you've got to worship. He's the one you put your money into. He's the one you put your offering and your tithes into. You know money is a corrupter. Corruption. Corruption. Corruption with money. Wow, I got to get out of here, out of this, this subject. I'm not, I'm not down against Catholics. When I went to the Holy Lands in 1973, there was none that carried us through the Holy Land. She carried us to different places. And as she did, she quoted the Bible. And she went by what the Bible said. And she was probably, maybe in my lifetime, one of the most spiritual people I ever met. A woman in a Catholic diocese wearing an, a nun's outfit and on her way to heaven. She knew that she had to pray directly to Jesus Christ in order to go to heaven. She knew that, that this guy that was running the church, this Pope guy, could not, he, he was not infallible. And we have found in recent years that many of them have fallen into uh, a place that they would have never fallen into 
had they followed Paul's advice, said if you're going to be a bishop, that's the leader of the church, that you had to be married. First thing you're supposed to do if you're a bishop of the church is you had to be married. You had to be the husband of one wife. And that you needed a family so you could uh, bring your family up, learn how to rule your own family, then you know how to rule the church. The church is a family. If you're a bishop, those people under you are your children. If you don't know how to rule your own house and your own children, you're not going to know how to rule your, your church. Uh, a guy that, that calls himself a bishop that has never had a family or any children doesn't know how to run a family. Only thing he can put out is law. And law is wicked. Just plain law, stating the fact, cold, hard facts. You follow this law. Nobody's going to be able to follow it. They're going to break it. That's why they have to come and confess to him and pay him. Pay him. Poorest countries in the world. I, went, I, I built a couple of churches down in Mexico. <clears throat> My uh, missionary friend that I was with said, uh, the only place in Mexico where there's air conditioning is in the Catholic Church. And the reason it's there is they have duped the people to believe that they had to pay to pray. And my missionary friend said, I'm going to take you down there and let you see something. And he took me down there. And I saw a poor man that couldn't feed his family. That wanted to pray a little higher today than he'd been praying because he's got some problems in his life. So he has to put his first coin in at the first saint. Has to put his second coin in at the second saint has to put more in at the third saint, has to put all he's got in at the fourth saint, leave out of there with no money, no answer to the prayer, prayed to the wrong thing. See, the devil's got his church too. The devil's got his way. And so has a poor man just put all of his money into the devil's offering and goes out of there hungry, cold, and indifferent and no answer to his prayer and no hope. There is no hope in other people. The only hope you have in life is Jesus Christ. You, I'm, I'm not talking just about to people that follow the Catholic denomination. There are many a denominations out here and sects out here that you can follow that are not godly. And God doesn't hear the prayer of any one of them. Not one of them. If you deny the fact that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, walked on this earth, and the only way you can go to heaven is through Him, then you're in a religion that belongs to the devil. Does not belong to God. It's opposite from God. God said the only way a man can go to heaven is through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way. You can knock on doors until the stars fall out of heaven, you ain't going to go to heaven. Knocking on doors. They ain't going to get you to heaven. You can do sacraments, and this is what Martin Luther said. He was crawling up a pair of steps in penance because he was born a human in sin. And he thought that he had to do something humanly in penance. He's crawling up these steps like with broken glass on them or whatever and they're rough. And his hands and his knees are bleeding. And in that day you, you carried a cross on your back and suffered physically something wicked to appease a God in heaven that doesn't require anything more than you just saying, God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. You can do all of the penance you want to. 
you can say all the rosary you want to. I, when I was a kid, I went to a parochial school for a bit uh, with a friend of mine, and I learned the rosary. Came very close to becoming a Catholic. Still would have died and went to hell as a Catholic. Because if I had followed what they're teaching right now, I, I would have waved Jesus off and said, hey, no, I don't believe Jesus. I don't believe what Jesus said. I don't believe that it was true that he said, come unto me and I will give you everything you need. He didn't say come unto the Pope. He said come unto me. If you bypass Jesus, you bypass salvation. You bypass eternal life. The only way you can come to eternal life is through Jesus Christ. You can't do it by serving Muhammad, by serving Buddha, by serving Confucius, by serving the Allah of the Quran. You can't do it by serving any other God. The first commandment was have no other gods before me. The God of heaven had no other gods before me. That's the God of heaven. All of these religions I just mentioned, and that was just a, a touch of hundreds of religions that are out there today. Hundreds of religions out there today. And that's just touching the iceberg of them. And <laughs> You know, it only took the tip of an iceberg. Just the tip of an iceberg to sink the Titanic. The tip of the iceberg ripped the side of the ship open and sunk the Titanic, the unsinkable ship. I heard a preacher say, the only thing that ship ever did was what it wasn't supposed to do. It was sent out as the unsinkable ship. And its record today is it did what it wasn't supposed to do. It sunk. And if you follow the religions of the world today, you're on a Titanic. When the tip of Jesus Christ touches that bow, all of that religion will sink. All of it. There are two kinds of people in this world. The saved that live forever and the lost that die and go to hell and live forever in hell. The second death is when you get cast into hell in the lake of fire. The second death for a Christian is his body dies once and that's it. He, he lives forever. There is no second death. Second death for a lost man is when he's separated from God forever, cast into the lake of fire, and live with the devil in hell forever. So I don't know what kind of religion you're in. Or if you're looking for something spiritual, you will find it in the King James Version Bible. You will find it in the books that Paul wrote. You will find it in Romans. You will find it in 1st, 2nd Corinthians. You will find it in Galatians. You will find it in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. You will find it in these 13 little uh, books that Paul wrote. First and second Thessalonians, you will learn how to live <clears throat> by it. In Timothy, you will be encouraged to be a minister. Uh, in second Timothy, you're going to be encouraged to be the Christian that will face some persecution. Christians that do not face persecution are not living the Christian life. The word Christian means Christ-like. There was no time, no place that Christ didn't witness. He sat down among the scribes and Pharisees and went to the house of sinners and eight. 
but he didn't partake of what they partook of other than to eat the food, but he put out a message. Every opportunity. If I was invited to the White House, if I was going to eat with the President, unless I was allowed to say grace, I would not eat with the President. If I was not allowed to say grace, I would not eat with the President. I'm not going to eat anything I don't ask God to bless. Anytime, anywhere. I don't care where I am. If I was in a conference, and I was the leader of that conference. And it's not a spiritual conference. I would stand up and say, if I'm the leader, hey folks, you may do what you want, but I can't eat unless I ask God to bless this food and I'm going to do that. And I know I'm going to get some conflict. But who cares? I'm not, I'm not out here to please mankind. I'm not here to please God. And I'm going to say blessing no matter where I eat or who I'm eating with. And uh, so, I, if I'm, I'm, I'm a paint contractor by trade, if I'm painting somebody's house and the man invites me to sit down at his table, and he's not a man that's subject to say grace, I'm going to identify myself. Yes, I'm a painter, sir. First, I'm a Christian. I cannot eat at your table without saying a blessing. May I say a blessing at your table? Do you know I always get the same answer? Yeah, go ahead. And I ask God to bless that food that was prepared in the hands that prepared it. And I ask God to watch over that family before it's everlastingly too late. They'll hear the truth and know the truth. Be able to come live with you in heaven. Amen. You say, Brother Peter, you do that in a man's house, you're painting for a lost man. Yes, I will. Have done it. And and look, we ought to stand up. We're not wimps. Christians are in a war. We're in a war against the devil. We got to know what the book says. Look in Titus. We went to first and second Timothy, encouraged. Encouraged, encouraged. And then we go to Titus and we get instruction. Instruction. Instruction for church leaders. Wow. Instructions about groups in the church. Instructions about Christian ethics. What is a Christian ethic? You say grace when you eat. I don't care if you're in McDonald's. If you're a McDonald's and you're a church member, there's two kinds of grace you're going to get in there. You're either going to say grace or you're going to be a disgrace. If you're a Christian and you're in the public and you do not say grace, you are a disgrace to the God that you claim salvation in. You're the most disgraceful person on earth. There are people in McDonald's that know that you go to a church and so you eat without saying grace. And they mark you down with a great big X. There's another one of them. There's another one of them. Goes down there to that church, claims to be something. He ain't nothing. He won't even bow his head and say grace in a public place. Yes, you're a disgrace. Most disgraceful thing there is is a Christian who don't act like a Christian when he's supposed to act like a Christian. If you don't act when you're supposed to, you're a disgrace to God and, and the, the name of Jesus Christ and of the church that you go to. In the book of Philemon, written to Philemon, we see the effect of reconciliation between a runaway slave and a Christian master. Wow, we're coming down to the nitty-gritty. 
you're a boss and you're a Christian. And you got some people that that just ain't doing right. You got a thing called reconciliation. Can you fire that person? You got this guy. He's he's he's, he's a pretty good worker, but he's trouble. He's always into something. You have a right to fire him. Good thing. Fire him. Point blank. Bring him in. Fire him. Say, you're done. This is it. You are fired. Here's your severance pay. Here's your check. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive you for the past. Hey, now I'm talking about a Christian boss. Here you are, you're a Christian boss. You say to this guy, or woman, whoever it be, I'm going to fire you, hey, service pay and everything. You're done. We are, we are totally separated party from each other. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to offer you a job. The job I'm going to offer you is the one you just got fired from. But this is what I want to see. I want to see a new person in that job. I don't want a rebel. I want a positive person. I don't want a person starting trouble. I don't want him doing this. I don't want him doing that. I don't want him doing this. I don't want him doing this. The five things you just mentioned are the five things he just got fired for. That's reconciliation. That's what reconciliation is. Do you know what you will have from that day forward? Do you know what you will have from that day forward? You'll have the best employee in the, in the place. Because he had been reconciled to the boss. And that's what Jesus did. He reconciled us to God. We were all fired. <laughs> by sin got every one of us fired from what we were supposed to be and Jesus called us up one day and said hey Peter you're fired and you're headed for eternal fire forever but I tell you what I'll do I'll, I'm going to fire you from what you are and then I'm going to hire you back as one of my righteous servants and I'm going to put you in a position. Still a painter. But I'm going to bless your work. I'm going to bless your life. I'm going to bless your children. I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bless you. What was my desire? My desire was to be a preacher. In this world today, education can keep you from being a preacher. It hasn't kept me from being a preacher, but it's kept me from having a work or having a church. But you know what I believe? I believe I'm where God wanted me. If I wasn't where God wanted me, I'd think I wasn't right. But I'm exactly where God wanted me, doing what I'm doing in a church, helping a preacher, helping the church, being a swift sailor. We're on a sea of life. Sailing one direction or the other. You're either sailing toward God, in God, or you're sailing away from God. But you're not sailing both directions at the same time. You can't go north and south at the same time. You can only go one direction. Are you headed in the right direction? Are you where God wants you? Are you doing are you doing your best at what God's positions you with? Are you doing your best? I have the fifth grade Sunday school class. I believe it's the turning point in the life of a child in the fifth grade. Absolute pivot turning point. He came out of the fourth grade kidney garden. And he's entering now into a fifth grade 
beginning of school, real school work, real learning, real uh, stability, real ability. Uh, I, he's, he's leaving the sandbox, if you please, and getting up into the real hardcore things of the world to study. Yes, learning two times two was four. Learning two and two was four. That basics over here in the fourth grade. Now he's in the fifth grade, he's got to learn why he knows that two times two is four, or two times whatever is what it is, so that he can use it over here in the beginning of knowledge. He learned the basis over here. Now he's in the beginning of knowledge, and that's where we've got him in our Sunday school. How long do you have them, Brother Peter? You've got about 40 minute, a 40 minute window if you're an astute teacher. You're going to try to get at least 40 minutes of teaching. Yes, you've got to have a little camaraderie. Yes, you've got to, you've got to uh, identify yourself with these boys. You've got to get back down in the fifth grade for a bit. Uh, we have, we've got a little rubber football in our class. I've got a trainee in there with me now. A man God sent to our church just for this position. You say there are many positions that look much higher. Yes, there are. But there's not one more important. This is the pivoting turning point for this child. He needs somebody to instill in him right now the need as he's changing in school and changing in things that he needs to change in his life and get God on the throne. And that while he's in school, he needs to have God on his mind. He needs to read a problem and say, to, not to himself, but in his mind. Say, God, I don't understand this. Can you help me? Would you give me some light on this subject? And you know what? God will. <laughs> God will hear you and he'll answer your prayer. You see, he's in the fifth grade. He's, he's nine years old, seven, eight, nine years old. That's right. And if, if you will help him in your little 40 minutes a week that you have him, to begin to develop that. To begin to be useful. I say in our church, if you're in the fifth grade and you want to sing in the adult choir, what do you do? You show up after Sunday school in the practice room and sit there and practice with them. When they walk out, on the podium, you walk out with them. If you're like some of my fifth-year-olds, you're standing in the back row and it looks like two people are missing because they can't see you because you're standing behind the people in front of you because you're short. But that's all right. You're doing what God said. You started out where God said start out and you're active. And you're learning something basic that many, many of the grown folks that are out there that you're singing to have not learned yet and that you're learning. And you're learning it in the fifth grade. Had they learned it in the fifth grade, they'd probably be in the choir now. And they would have had a much easier life. You're going to have some hard times in life. Let's do it quick. we got a few seconds. Just a few seconds. Let's run over this real quick. Uh, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st uh, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Those are, are all very important study books. You need to study every one of them one at a time. You need to find you uh, some good, like behind me here, find you some good books that tell you about things. Find you something from uh, from the past, a good Bible with side notes in it, help notes in it. One that says King James Version on it. that has the help notes and everything in it. Find that. Get in it. Get these little books, 13 little books. Get them down. 
Let them speak to you. Learn what they say. Learn what they are. And God will bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye.